We're live. <laughs> we are live. We are live. <laughs> we can. Give a minute for people to start getting on. Thank you, everybody, for being here. Hi, everybody. Thank you. I to go. I can't see. We're going to get started today with, um, I want to get started with a prayer to center ourselves and to call in the good spirits to help us and inspire us here today to remember to remember the journey, Rose's journey, to remember the everything, everything that she has gone through, and to have the intention here today of sharing her story so that she can be of help and of service. Her story may be of help and service to all those that are going to listen to it, and may be a story of empowerment, a story of resilience, it may help all of those that are going to be listening today. We're going to go slow. We're going to be centered. We're going to be present. And hopefully, those people that are listening today can also be present with us and listen carefully with their hearts, with their ears open, their hearts open, their brains, their minds open. We thank all of those that went before us to the other side that opened the door of eternity to us, they open the door of more, they open the door of spirit to us. Here we go. <laughs> so thank my you. first question to you, Rosie, first of all, thank you so much for being here and, and being willing to share this very intimate and sacred thing, experience that you've gone through in your life. Many years went by but I would like to ask you the first question, which is, when was the first time that you encountered death? When was the first time that death knocked on the door of Rosie's life? Do you remember? It was when my mom passed away, 1996. Do you, were you expecting that or were you living without even contemplating death until that time? I was, I lived without contemplating death until that time and still when I was in it, it still didn't feel like death wasn't, uh, that death was a thing. I was living knowing that the time was limited, but never in that time really like thought that it was real, if that mm. makes any sense. So you say that because you thought that your mom was going to be recovering from what she was going through? Yeah, I was in complete denial. You were in complete denial? Oh, in complete denial. Yeah. So would you like to explain what happened? Sure. What did um, she have? She, um, she had been sick for about a month with a horrible cough. My mom was uh, an avid smoker for years, and she was very young, at a very young age. Um, and she came down with a really bad cold and then a lingering cough that wouldn't go away. Um, but like everybody else in my family that had that mentality that, you know, you never go to the doctor, you just try home remedies, and you figure it out at home, right? So she didn't go to the doctor. Well, it got to the point where the cough was so bad that she um, went to the doctor because <laughs> she had no choice but to go because mm. uh, then the cough became painful. And it was at that time that then, you know, they started running all kinds of tests on her, and it was discovered that she had a, um, a mass tumor in her lung, and then discovered that it had also been in her breast. Now they didn't, couldn't tell if it was from the breast to lung or from lung to breast. Um, if I were to guess correctly, I would say from lung to breast, because she was an avid smoker for so many years, that um, that would make the most sense. Um, but at that point, it didn't matter. It, the fact was that she had what she had. So um, she was diagnosed and basically started, was, she gave, was given the option to start treatment. Um, and she did. So and then, then this chemotherapy? The chemotherapy. She started chemotherapy and then at that time, uh, no prognosis was given yet. Like we were still, you know, hopeful and nothing had been set in stone of what her time was and all that stuff because they thought that by giving her some chemo and trying to reduce the tumor that they would be able to go in and operate. 
So then the doctor, when all that happened, decided, okay, we're going to go in um, to try to operate the lung and uh, to remove a quarter like of the lung, of one of her lungs, because she could survive with one and a half or one and three quarters of a lung. So we, everybody agreed she was good with that. So when the day of the surgery came, the doctor said, we're going to go in. Now, if at, when we go in, we may find more stuff, because they did a scan and everything else. Uh, but there's, like, there's stuff that maybe we've missed. If we go in, <clears throat> the surgery is about a four-hour surgery. If we go in and we discover something more, that we can't go further, then we're going to have to stop and just close her back up, and then, you know, that's it. Um, he says, uh, we will know that within the first 45 minutes of the surgery. Um, so we sat there in the waiting room and um, praying that that doctor wouldn't come out. <laughs> you know, the 45 minutes would pass and he wouldn't come out. And, of course, within the 40 minutes, he came out and he basically told us that when they went in, they discovered that it had metastasized into her liver. And they had to close her back up. So um, that was like devastating news because now we knew that at that moment, that was the end of it. The worst part was her coming out of surgery because she had already been put under and everything, her coming out of that and thinking that she had surgery and that everything was gonna be okay. So now we had to go through that process. You know, we were already going through the process of knowing that it was spread, and now we're gonna to have to go to the process of telling her that she didn't have a surgery. So they basically closed her back up, and then we had to go through that process. And that was probably, you know, from the diagnosis was paralyzing, then that part of it was just completely devastating because then right now you know that there's nothing more that can be done. And once it metastasizes into the liver, for those of you that know, um, the liver is basically the filter of the blood in, this, in your system, in your body. So, when um, it's not operable. So at that moment then, um, we all gathered and tried to figure out how we're gonna talk to her and we told the doctor, can you be the one to please break the news because we don't even know how to tell her this. And everything, you know, he said, yeah, I'll do that. And, um, and then basically it was a matter of just taking her home at that point. Doctor came and spoke to us again and said, you know, she's got at the most six to seven months to live. And that's when the hiatus started because then that's when, you know, yeah, it wasn't complete denial, but you know, in my mind I knew that's something at some point was going to happen, and it was so, so conflicting for me at that moment. Um, How old were you? I was 26, 26 years old. So then it was basically just kind of like just take her home, and there's nothing more we could do at this point, and that's when the entire hiatus started for me personally because um, I have to say that that just became so confusing for me, and so I was so mad that I couldn't get past it, right? So in all of that turmoil, you know, um, you know, while you know, you know, we were showing up for her and everything at some point, I just started to literally, um, my coping mechanism at that point was to basically just go out and just party. So I started to go out and I started to go out and go out, and that was my escape. And then I would come back home, and at that moment, um, I had my daughter was uh, five years old, and I was also separated and going through a divorce at the same time. Um, so it was a, a, like a combination of, of so many different things that were happening that I honestly, at 26 years old, I didn't even know what, what the heck I was doing, what I was gonna do, and um, and then that's when everything started. It's that whole process of just, it's like a waiting game after that. And what I basically tried to do was just spend as much time as I could and like please her as much as we could and everybody was on the same page. And, um, but all of us were going through our process in a different, ma in a different way. You know, some handled it better than others, others didn't handle it at all. And it was like, and we just didn't know how to even like handle each other in the process either because we were all 
like in this turmoil of, of uh, you know, of like fear and anxiety and sadness and we didn't know. So we're all trying to show up in the correct way for her, but the reality was is that, I mean, it was just devastating. So we didn't really know how to, how to navigate that. Um, it was the first, um, like I was saying, like a first pretty much sit big situation in our family. Our family was a huge family, uh, very tight knit. And um, it just, like everything fell apart. So the moment arrives in which she finally transitions and did you take care of everything that needed to be taken care of afterwards that usually, you know, um, where to put her and all the documents and all the, all the things that need to be done after somebody passes? We didn't know where to begin. We had no plan. Our only plan was is just to to try to keep her as long as possible, um, the best way possible. We didn't have a plan. We didn't know what to do. Mm. We had no idea. So, you know, there's a lot of stuff in between, but I don't know that we could squeeze all that into just like this hour um, that transpired from that time. I do remember <clears throat> the last uh, Christmas celebration we had, Christmas and New Year's, um, that we had, we like usual would do like parties, like a family parties at home, and we, you know, we we did that, and she was um, she was present, and I remember her sitting there, and you know, she was just watching us all, just you know, try to like animate and be happy, and you know, and just be there, and just act like nothing was happening because we wanted, because we we can't, we knew all knew it would be her last mm. holiday, um, but we didn't want to make it a somber one, you know, whatever. And she was sitting there, mind you, she had still not had full surgery, but she still had, like, an incision, you know what I mean? She was still going through it. Um, and I remember her at the end of the night, she sat there, <clears throat> and she just looked at, she just looked at us, and, and she said, you know, you guys look like a bunch of clowns. You know, you're putting on this act, and you don't have to do this. You know, and I appreciate it, but you don't have to do this. You know, you guys don't have to do this. And then all of us were just like, wow, like here we thought we were like, woo, you know, like making her feel better, you know, great. And she was watching us just knowing that we were, it was just a complete act. We were just, you know, trying to make it better for her, you know? Mm -hmm. So, um, have you, had you talked with your mom about, you know, I don't know, what, what was your belief about the afterlife in that moment? Uh, my mom was a, an avid Christian. Um, woman, and she she was okay with passing. with passing. She understood it, mm -hmm. um, and she was okay with with her relationship with God and and you know. And her only thing was that she was just sad that she was leaving us. Like her worry, you know, it wasn't even about her. It was it's just who she was. Um, that she was more worried about us. So there were times when she would even feel really bad and she wouldn't, she would try to just act like nothing was going on because she was more worried of how I was feeling, how my brothers were feeling, how my dad was feeling. Um, so that she could, you know, she was still, even in her worst state, she was still worried, you know, to make sure that everybody was okay. Um, Had you talked with her about things like when you cross over and you arrive somewhere to let me know about the fact that you're okay? No. No, you didn't. We didn't talk about that because we, like I said, we we didn't know about, you know what I mean? Like now, if it were to be happening now, I would definitely sit there like I did with my grandmother in 2015, you know? Like we talked about those things, you know? But with her, we didn't because we didn't know. We didn't know what the heck we were doing, you know? So um, do you think... Okay, we're going to get to the good parts afterwards, yeah, yeah. right? But mm -hmm. right now, it's good yeah. to explore a little bit what happened. Um, so once she crosses over, how is your life? How does your life, life look like? <laughs> okay. So let's backtrack a little bit into when, you know, she 
she passes, right? She she transitions and she she's gone. So now back in the day, funeral services were 12 hours, 24 hours, which to me is ridiculous, um, because it's just like like adding like acid to like a wound. You know what I mean? It's so painful, um, and it's so long. So I remember that we were there, and I remember like you know. It was a, her service was 24 hour service. And I remember out of those 24 hours, 22 hours of it, I spent kneeling at her casket because I like knew at that point that that was the last physical, like visual um, moment time that I was gonna have with her. So I didn't wanna separate myself from the, you know, for that reason I thought, you know, I wanna be able to absorb every part of her, even though her spirit was, no longer there, it was just her physical flesh, right? Mm -hmm. um, and for like 22 hours, I have probably 20, 22 hours, I literally kneeled there, literally just talking to her. And I mean, her and I had talked a lot before, you know, that she passed about a lot of things and, and we were really good, uh, you know, before she passed, but this was me just in my mind thinking, okay, this is my last moment, this is it, this is it, this is it. So, um, and then, like my dad, remember, would tell me, you got to move out of the way because people want to come and pay their respects. And I'm like, well, I, tough shit. Like, basically, I don't care. Because now I'm mad at the world, and I'm mad at God, and I'm mad at everything. And nothing matters, right? I'm completely blocked off like a, like a horse, you know, like a, with blinders on. And, um, and then I remember, you know, like that moment when we had to close that. And I knew that that was the final. That was it. Um, and that, I have to say, and even going back a little bit further, um, and I've said this from the day that it happened, that when my mom transitioned and my mom died, like, I felt like I died with her. I died that day, and I was reborn another person, because now I had to learn how to navigate and live without her in my life, right? Without her presence in my life. Um, you know, and I had a really tight relationship with her and she was everything to me. We would talk a thousand times a day for no reason. We would exchange ideas, we would spend time together and all of a sudden that, oh, that's like, very, like a rug pulled from under me, that's it, it's gone. Shut down, that's it, out of business, no matter. Um, so I, I, I always refer to it and I say that when my mom died, like I died with her and then I was reborn into another person because now I was another person. Like the person who I was no longer existed and now it's this other person learning from scratch how to navigate and how to live you know, in life without the most important person in your life, right? Which is your mom, you know, like she was everything to me. She still is. And at a young age, with a young child, with a small child, going through a divorce, you know, separation and divorce, and that was just like, you know, you're, you know, you're left like you're so shaken. And, um, and at that moment, I had to learn how to, to live again, in this other phase, of my life, right, without her, and, and I spiraled horribly, after that. Um, you know, just wanting to escape every every part of my existence, every part of my life. It was life altering. It was shifting. It shifted everything for me, um, and I was just navigating through life, escaping. You know, I was drinking a lot at that time. Um, thankfully, I had a huge amount of support from my daughter's um, family, uh, Anya, which is my family too, on her dad's side. Um, they really pulled through and they would help me so much with her, you know, and they would take her um, so that I can have time to, to grieve. But the reality of it was is that in me not having that responsibility, I was like, I, I, I was spiraling because I didn't have, you know, um, to the point where, you know, there was a moment when I literally, you know, lost my, almost lost my job. Um, and I was about to lose everything, really. So, you know, there was one day I just woke up and I said, you know, it's enough, you need to pull yourself together. And it was at that moment that I realized that, you know, I had someone to live for. 
which is my daughter. And she became the anchor for everything in my life. And she was my purpose. She was the only reason that I wanted to even stay alive. Um, because I've told her, and, and I will say this, and it's going to be m the most cowardly thing that I probably would have ever said in my life, but had it not been because I had my daughter, um, I probably wouldn't be sitting here telling this story. I can guarantee you that. I, I, I didn't want to exist. I didn't want to live. I didn't want to be here. Um, and it was, you know, having her and the responsibility of being a parent and showing up for her that, um, like, grounded me to the point of, of knowing that I needed to continue and that I needed to keep. So she became my lifeline, almost in, obs in an obsessive form that it was everything. It was just like she was the center of it, you know what I mean, in every part of it, right? So, um, but in that, right, because now you're kicked into survival mode, which is exactly what happened, and you're literally navigating um, in life and trying to figure things out. Uh, with a small child, a single parent, a job, a house, you know, to, to like continue. You have to continue, right? So what do you do? You continue. And then, um, and I went into survival mode. And in that time, you know, I realized later, you know, through conversations with her that I was doing things for her, but I wasn't doing things like with her. So, you know, mm. and... And then I look back now, it's like, what was, what was happening, right? And it was because I was, like, my survival mode went on, and I was just making sure that everything was taken care of, right? But all the other sensitive, or I was, like, desensitized, mm. you know, from so many things, right? I wasn't even feeling feelings at some point. If I Now, through this entire journey of, of you know, spiritual healing and... and you know, and all the other deep work that I've done, I realized that that's exactly what was happening. I became desensitized to to my existence. You know what I mean? And I was just in full survival mode. Um, it was very paralyzing, and it was very, you know, um, challenging. You know, um, at times because you know you feel like you cannot go. So I got really in this really bad, like, you know survival mode, so I, I literally wore myself out sometimes where I feel like I just couldn't continue, and then I was so mad, like I said, that I kept a lot of, you know, throughout the process, and then looking back, I um, hurt a lot of people. I was in relationships that I probably shouldn't have been in for the wrong reasons, mm -hmm. trying to fill the void, the void that nothing could have filled. Nothing, no, no one, no nothing could have filled that, but at that time I didn't know that. So I just went in life just, you know, like, you know, going and just, you know, having failed relationships and just having, like, you know, and, and I was projecting all of my anger out into other people, into, you know, situations in my life, at times even towards my daughter, you know, and, um, you know, so, there it, was a, a dark night of the soul that lasted a long time. A very long time. A very long time. Thank you for exploring all of that. Um, I don't feel like uh, there is enough attention that goes into the heartache yeah. and the consequences of the fact that this society doesn't really know. The society, the system in general, doesn't really know how to support people that go through something so raw and so real, which is death. And nobody wants to talk about it. Nobody wants to talk about the consequences and uh, pretend that nothing is happening. Right. When in reality, inside of a person, a person want, is willing, is wanting to die, doesn't really know how to put themselves together. So you had that moment of you saying like, okay, I need to put myself together and just like do something else. But do you think that that was the breakthrough or is there a moment in which there was a breakthrough? Yeah, there was a moment there was a full breakthrough. Um, well, the breakthrough was at time when I was literally at the, you know, I, I know that I was spiraling very badly. And then, um, you know, I had what I call a come to Jesus talk with myself and said, you know, this is nonsense and you're going to lose everything. You have a child, you have, you know, a job, you have a life. Life has to continue. Um, 
And, you know, I just had a talk with myself and said, enough is enough. And like, you need to pick up the pieces here and continue because none of this that you're doing, none of this destructive behavior that you're having or doing is gonna bring her back. It's not gonna change anything. You know, it's not gonna, you know, miraculously like, you know, make it all go away. Um, and then it settled in, <clears throat> that's when I said, when that's when I kicked into like survival mode. And then it was that way for a very long time. Um, and so that was the truth. It's a little harsh to hear the truth when you are in that yeah. moment. Mm -hmm. Because you want to s slap everybody's face. Like, yeah, I, don't yeah I wanted to fight. I just wanted to fight, you know? And, you know, I just wanted to be, I don't know, I just was, I had so much rage, so much anger, you know, like I said, with life. And I, cause I didn't understand any of it. And I, for so many years, I was trying to, I was like with this big why with a question mark in my head constantly, like, why? Like, why? My mom was full, a lady that was full of life. She was my age right now when she passed away. She was young, you know, full of life. You know, she was full of light. She, she I mean, she was just, uh, you know, a ray of sunshine and loved by so many people, you know, and to know that, the, you know, to realize that these things, that this happened, it was like, I had a big, like, why moment for many, 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 many years, you know? Um, until I stopped, you know, I started doing some deep rooted work and, 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 I, and I said, I have to stop trying to figure it out and start trying how to figure out how to live my life in a, in a, in a, in a substantial, joyful way that I can continue, you know, to serve myself and serve the people that are around me, um, you know, so that I can, you know, I, I don't know how to explain it, so I could just, live this life without having to be so mad and so, you know, angry. So I went to tons of, I, like, I did therapy, but, you know, therapy sometimes is not the best to Talk therapy? So you're just talking to somebody? You yeah, don't... somebody that's just taking notes and then gives you homework and then it just, right. yeah, right? <laughs> you know, yeah, it's awful, but, you know, I, they, I mean, I tried, they tried. I mean, we, it, it, it's a thing you have to give it a shot, right? And then you think, okay, this one didn't work. Well, let's try this one. And then, you know, and then that one doesn't work. And then you're like, okay, so what's next, right? What, what? So then I started, you know, doing some, some soul searching, what I call, because I, I really wanted to break away from that anger and from that fear and from that um, uncertainty because I just wasn't living a full life at that point. And so... I want to fast forward a little bit into um, 2000 and I want to say 2014, I think it was. Um, I was doing a little bit of research and through a, a cousin of mine, um, Val, that she follows Jen Pastelov, which is, she's a uh, yoga meditation, journaling, um, you know, she, she was, and she would have retreats. And I remember I had bought her book, I'd read her book, and then she was having a Mother's Day retreat. And I was very interested in it, because it was a journaling, yoga, and meditation, but her retreats are different. They're not really all that, like, yoga all the time. It's like, it's more like, more about connecting, you know, like human connection and just going deep and journaling deep and all that. But it was on Mother's Day weekend. And I have <laughs> my child, right? So I'm like, like she's already grown, but I've never not had a Mother's Day, you know, with her, uh -huh. not with her. But then I called my daughter and I said, you know, this is happening. And she's like, you need to hit the send button, like send them the confirmation that you're going to go, you're going to show up, you're going to go to this thing, whatever. I'm like, how am I supposed to leave? She's like, you're going to go, you're going to go, you're going to go. Anyway, she encouraged me. Like, like she's been all along, she, like my daughter's been like my greatest um, teacher in this world um, and continues to be. And she encouraged me to go and I said, okay, well, if I have her blessing, then I think I, this is a go. So I signed up and it was in Ojai, California, in uh, the valley. I, I took myself on a plane to LA, flew into LA, drove two hours into the valley by myself in the middle of the night because I got there like at 2 a.m. And um, got together with about 24 other women that were coming from all parts of the, you know, the country. And we all united there. And it was, um, that whole retreat was a lot about journaling. And I remember uh, sitting in, in one of the, the, you know, the workshops we were doing. And it was about writing a letter 
to your mom or in the or and then the other part was having writing a letter of how you think your mom would write a letter to you right and if i had ever journaled ever this was the moment like i was just like writing and writing and writing and writing and writing and it was like so much and then at the end they're like you have an option to read what you wrote and I don't know what, something called my heart to say, read it. Because I needed to verbalize this, right? I needed to read it out loud. And I literally sobbed the entire way. And it was not up until that retreat, which was so many years later, that I realized that I had not properly grieved mm. the death of my mother. And that was another breakthrough that I had. And then it was at that moment that I said, like, this is your moment to start your real healing journey. This is this is and that was the catalyst for everything else that's happened up until now. Um, I um, that retreat was uh, was life changing for me. It was very impactful. I not only connected with so many different women from so many different paths of paths of life. It it truly like allowed me the full expression of everything that I had been internalizing, all the pain, all the anger, like I felt like I released a lot of it there during that retreat. And um, yeah, it was uh, definitely life-changing for me to have that experience. I'm so grateful for that to happen. And then after that, it was just, I started doing more and more and getting more involved and creating more of a community and did so many other things and I have so many people to be grateful for um, that, were part of my journey that have held my hand, held space, and continue to do so because I feel that this grieving journey is never ending. And I always say, you know, you get through it, you'd never get over it because you go through it. You get through it. You'll never get over it. Um, and I always say that, you know, if, if anyone knows anybody that's grieving, please do don't try to put a timeline on that, what that grief should look like or what it should be like. Grief doesn't have a timeline. It doesn't have a deadline. It doesn't have an end goal. It doesn't have a stop. It's a continuous heartache that never stops. It never stops. And, you know, and now, like, I revert back, and, you know, of course I tried, you know, I live my life now and I'm talking about it still takes me back to like very emotional part because it, 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 it is like it has been a very emotional uh like journey for me but um a lot of people sometimes say but how can you be after so many years it's been 20 something years and and then I'm like you know if you know the grieving is a sign that you have loved enough to grieve enough right because if there's no grief there was no love I feel in my heart that to be such a true statement because, um, you know, you grieve every part of it because you miss the person, you miss that relationship, you miss that connection, you miss the guidance, you know, you miss, all, you know, every every aspect of it, you know, that it's just like robbed from you. I feel like I was robbed from that. And then not only that, that I go through that. My mom was in 96. My grandfather on my mom's side passed away in 2000. Her sister passed away in, I mean, in 99, my grandfather. In 2000, her other sister passed away. 2005, my dad passes away. And then in 2009, my mom's other sister passes away. So now my grandmother's three daughters pass away. And they all are gone to cancer. And so it was like one hit, then another hit, and then another hit, and then another hit. And... And you're like, now we are left with like no family, really. No, no elders. We have no elders. We only have like one uncle that's still alive. And, um, but we are left with like all the cousins and all of us. We're just left with no, no elders. This is just in our family completely like has like vanished. Like not vanished, but it's just like everything has just like stopped. You know, and we still tried with our cousins to kind of still try to get together and still, you know, have a close relationship. You know, but, you know, we we don't have that, you know, that. Now you are the elders. I am the elder. <laughs> you are the elder. <laughs> I don't want to adult anymore, but I am the elder. <laughs> but, yeah, so. 
So I have a couple more questions to ask you, a little bit more on the bright side. And one of them is, what do you think your mom is doing on the other side? My mom is sitting probably on a beach in Mexico, heaven <laughs> island somewhere with a margarita, living her best life. Because that's what she always dreamed about doing. And she never got to do that, by the way. I felt she was always a Mexican at heart because Mexico was her heart. She loved it. She dreamed about it. And she never got to. She to never got to here. go. And you know, her, she's she, we, um, in, our, in all of her conversations before she passed. Uh, we would lay, I would lay with her and talk to her. She would always tell me, "Do not ever not do anything that you want to do," which is another part of why I live my life so fully. And I, I just go in like head first, and I'm like. You know, because I'm not going to not do this and I'm not going to not do that because, you know, I saw what happened with her. And she, yeah, she took care of us. She was, you know, a homemaker. She took care of her family and everything. But she missed out on things that she wanted to do for herself. And Mexico was one of those things. And she did tell me, like, do not ever not do anything you want to do in this life. Do not leave any stone unturned that you want to discover. Do it as long as you don't hurt anybody and you stay, you know, in you know, right with yourself, like, do it, just do it. So, and, and, and that's why I live, live life so on purpose. I live my life on purpose. Like, I want to rob every second of everything. And like, my friends tell me that I have, a, like, a, the fear of missing out. It's like FOMO thing, because I never want to miss anything. That's why my social life is always so intense, because I don't want to miss anything. Um, but you know, and I, I'm good with that. And, and I, luckily I am able to do it, you know, and, and I can, and I, you know, I have the ability to do it. So why not? Do you know? So, so that's what you think that she's doing. And how do you think that she feels about you and your life? Oh my God. She's, she's, I have to say that I, if I, um, I want to believe in my heart that she thinks I'm a badass. She thinks I'm a badass. <laughs> <laughs> I just know that. Um, and she's very proud. I believe that too. And um, I have to say that I have also lived on purpose trying to beat that be the end goal for me is, you know, to live fully and, you know, in, in every way, not just, you know, um, me personally, but professionally, you know, try to be better every day as a parent. Um, cause God knows I've made a ton of mistakes along the way. So many, so many, but you know, we're all just trying to survive and do our best and do the best that we can with what we have and what we know, you know, and with whatever pain or heartache we're carrying in our hearts and in our life, you know, it's, a, um, but yeah, so. So I have another question, which is now with all that you said, with all that you have gone through, with all the insight that you have now. How, what are some things that you would have done differently with the awareness that you have now, if there are any? Differently, you mean post? Yeah. Yes, during the time of her disease and, and post her transition. I would definitely say that I would encourage anybody who goes through this now do not get stuck in the rut. Do not get stuck in the anger. Do not suppress your feelings if you want to grieve whatever way that looks like. If it's partying, party. If it's crying, cry. If it's, you know, I don't know, whatever. Climbing a mountain, climb it, you know. Um, do not suppress grieving, mourning, uh, the pain, the sadness, to not suppress it because you will crash and burn. You will get to a point where you will crash and burn. And try to live fully in the beauty of the time that you had with your loved one, um, what that looked like for you, and carry that with you, which is what I do now. I carry you know, the joyful moments, the memories, 
um, you know, the the good times and everything that I, that we lived as a child, as even as growing up as teenagers. And I mean, we didn't have a perfect life either, but you know, there was a lot of perfect moments. So we were perfectly imperfect in our own way, um, and it worked for us. So I would definitely encourage to seek community, to seek resources, find your place, find your people. You know, it's out there. You know, do not feel like you're alone because you're not. There's a million other people grieving, a million other people going through loss and heartache and sadness. There's a lot of people trying to figure it out. Um, and, and, you know, if you can lend a hand, if you can make a phone call, if you can stop by, reach out, you know, like I have a friend, my dear friend Barbara, that I've been friends with her for like over, you know, all these years, you know, like almost 30 years, 20 something years, you know, to make sure to check in on your friends, you know, make sure that they're good. And some people, when they're grieving, will tell you, I don't want to talk to anybody. I don't want to deal with anybody. Mm. Bullshit. Like, people need the support. People need the hand-holding. People need the love. They need the, comp the you know, just in the ear, you know, just for you to sit with them or, you know, just, I don't know, just be present. Be present for them. Um, and I have to say, if, if anybody's going through it, they definitely, you need to seek out help. There is, especially in so much more now, so much... Um, resources and, and groups and there's retreats and there is uh, a community. You just have to create a community for yourself. And I have been blessed with that throughout all of these years that I have people that have my back. I mean, and you know, that, that are just so true to me and, and I, I, I just, that will never go unnoticed, you know? And I just hope that I'm showing up in the same way for them back, especially friends of mine that have also lost their moms. Um, they're very near and dear to me, and we're constantly sharing and, you know, like, like bouncing things off each other, you know, like, how was this? Remember that? Or I'm thinking of this. I'm sure that your mom and my mom are like, you know, they're hanging out and this, that, and the other. Today, casually, I was talking to a friend of mine. They're like, oh, I bet you they're having coffee up there knowing that you're going to this today. and da, da, da. You know, like, things like that. So, you know, it's some encouragement, and every, we all share our stories, and we all talk about it, because it, you, even after all these years, you still want to talk about it. You do not not want to talk right. about it, you know, like right now. And I have been wanting to do this for so long, right? But I never felt like I was ready. But then, of course, with all of the things that life has taken away, it has gifted me back so many beautiful things and so many beautiful people. And, and you being one of them, that you have provided the space for me um, to do that, you know, with all the respect in the world. Because I know that, you know, You've been probably dying to tap into that, <laughs> that channel needs a bigger, like whatever, but you know, I don't mess with that. So I'm like, okay, no, I'm not ready to do that. But, you know, in a very, very loving way, a very patient way, you have navigated with me. I and waited, I waited. Your mom gave him the vision last week or two weeks ago. Yeah. When was it? So I have another question that I need to ask you. I have a couple more. Oh my goodness, they, they're, if there is anybody here connected on Instagram and they want to ask questions, please do. We're gonna go, we're gonna go ahead and respond to them. We're gonna look at them at the end. Um, oh my goodness gracious. You have, by no, the way, no, we didn't plan any of this. We just, she has questions on that piece of yes, paper, but I, I don't know, we didn't plan any of this. We didn't practice any of this. This is just as raw as it gets. So we're going like piece by piece. Um, I, there was another question that I wanted to ask you. It's going to come back to me, but I, uh, I had these two. One is, um, how is knowing that your mom is still alive, even if she doesn't have a body? Oh, it's that the life is frozen. No, we were frozen. I think we were frozen. The life should be good. How is... Uh, were we still frozen now? I think we should be good, because otherwise we would be frozen. There's not much service in here. Should we put it on Wi-Fi? No, this, it should be very, very good, actually, very fast. <coughs> okay. Oh, no, no you're, you're not. not. Okay, perfect. <laughs> thank like, you. No, you're not. Um, okay, awesome, thank so you. So how is knowing that your mom is still alive but not in a physical body changes your relationship to death? That now, before it was like, okay, I'm angry and I'm sad and I want to fight. How does it make you feel knowing that 
oh, she still exists. Like she's not actually gone. She's just gone from my the physical form. Yes. Yeah. It's it's um. It's actually it's been a game changer for me to know that because you know a lot of times we think people die and they die. You know, no. It's just that the the flesh in this existence has gone away, but. I feel that her spirit is very much alive. I feel her constantly in everything. Do you have a sign that she sends you that you know like it's her sending you a hello from the other side? Um, it's been different things. Can you say like, one or two things? Um, different things and I have to say it's more of a feeling than anything else and it's like I constantly, I feel all the time that I feel it like when I'm in them and it's weird because I'm, when I least, I'm like, it's, it's like almost a feeling of like, like that kind mm -hmm. of thing. That I feel that constantly, um, and believe it or not, even and it's gonna sound really, really, really weird because most people don't. A lot of people don't believe in this, but my dog, like on two or three occasions, has. I haven't been able to find her in my in my apartment, and then I go and like in the middle of the night, she'll be sitting in in like in the bathroom, and like she'll be like staring out, like she's seeing something, right? But she's not focused on me, and a lot of times I feel like her spirit is very much alive, you know, in my space wherever I'm. So you would uh, uh, suggest people to redirect their focus on feeling whatever feelings they have and then solutionism, that's what I would call solutionism, like things that would m help you, m make you feel better? Yeah. Like I said, yeah, feel your feelings. Feel your feelings, you know, and, and please don't let anybody ever tell you you shouldn't be feeling this way or the other or that you should be already over it or that you shouldn't still be, you know, feeling a certain way, you know, like n nobody knows what you're feeling but you. And you have to honor that. You have to honor your feelings. Um, even if, if it's not, let's just say, maybe it's not grieving in general, in life in general, you have to honor your feelings or whatever. It, it shouldn't be robbed from you. I tell you, oh, you shouldn't be crying or you shouldn't cry or stop crying, you know, or, you know, don't, feel this or don't do that or it's been too long already like you know no you know i i want to grieve and let me let me do whatever that just like uh the baby now that is screaming <laughs> i wanted to ask you so do you think like do you feel like everything that happened with your mom transition of course it prepared you from the tr for the transitions that came after that but do you feel like it made you more compassionate and oh, more empathetic a hundred percent a hundred percent yeah, definitely. It's taking it into a, like a whole other level. Um, my level of compassion and empathy and understanding and being open, you know, is like those things that they say, like, please always be kind because you don't know what someone's going through. And I apply that daily to my life. You know, if people, like, I find people in the street that they're just being mean or people that are, like, you know, whatever, hostile. And, you know, I don't take it personal. I'm like, I, like, what's happening? Like, you know, what are you going through? You know what I mean? It's a real thing. And most people, even more now, um, they're going through a lot of mental mental um, issues, a lot of emotional. Um, this world is broken, you know? And, and, and it's hard to navigate it as it is. Imagine having to do that while you're, you know, potentially losing a loved one. And then, you know, so you have to always show up, you know, with, with love and compassion and understanding because everybody is going through something. Um, just like when I go to breath work, um, my friend Miria, she has uh, breath work classes sometimes that she comes and does them here. And I always tell her, I mean, is there ever a time when I'm not going to go deep? Because I go deep. And she said to me, um, <laughs> she said to me, no, you're never going to stop going deep because the day you stop going deep, then that's the day that you are no longer existing, right? Because you're going to you're gonna continue to go deep. Um, so... You know, if I could be that voice of, of um, I don't know, hope. of hope, um, like I said, you get through it, you'll never get over it. It's doable. Um, but if you're going to be here and you're going to go through it, make it the best possible. Find a way to, to, to pour your heart into everything that you do and to live life on purpose and, you know, and show up for people that are potentially going through things too, like maybe lose, you know, lose a loved one or whatever. Um, show up for them, you know, show compassion. You know, we have enough 
enough bad things going on, you know, the last thing we need is to continue to add to that. So I think with one person um, that's putting out that into the world and showing up, you know what I mean? One by one, we can make such a difference as a whole. Even outside of just grieving, it's in daily life, you know what I mean? It doesn't matter. Um, it just, um, you can apply it in any, in any part of, you know. They're asking you if you go to the cemetery. I don't. <laughs> do you have a, an altar at the house? I do. To honor your mom? Yeah, I do. Um, I don't go to the cemetery because the cemetery for me gives me a sense of like um, of emptiness and I don't, I leave there with a very, I don't know, very empty. Um, so I don't go. I have gone, but I don't go periodically or anything. I do have an altar at home with her picture that I buy flowers every week and I honor her that way. And the picture is of her and her. I remember, I remember the question that I need to ask you. What? Is there a question that I didn't ask you that you wanted for me to ask you? Oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh my God, why am I not surprised? <laughs> because maybe there is a question there like, I hope that she asked me that question and I didn't ask you. Um, I don't know right now. I can't think of anything. Okay. I can't think of anything right now that I don't. In case we can make a story on Instagram and and share that question. Yeah. If something will come to me. But her altar is beautiful, and Hermes is always attracted to yeah. the altar that she has at her office he, and at her house, always messing around with the things yeah. there. He loves that altar, but I let him mess with it, and then I'll, I'll just I go back and fix it afterwards because, you know, it makes him happy. So it's all about Some, do you feel like um, to end off this, um, this? Are we done? Yeah, we have a few minutes. Oh my minutes. God. Yeah, it's I know. Like we just started. We need to do it again. Yeah. Um, do you feel like in any way you're grateful to what happened to your mom transitioning? Do you feel like you would be the same person that you are now if that didn't happen? No, absolutely not. Would you have spiraled down anyways? No, if had, if absolutely had... not. But I could tell you this. Had that, that, had that not happened, I wouldn't be who I am today. It took all that grief and all that pain and all that suffering for me to be here to where I am today in this state of, of just complete, you know, self-awareness and joy and spirituality and just love and compassion and all of that. I don't know that I would, I would, I don't, I know that I would not be the same person. So I, these are all life situations and lessons that, you know, that, bring you here to where you are now mm -hmm. and I'm you know in a way and if I look at it that way then I'm grateful because I, I I love who I have become and who I am you know and I'm so I don't know I have a lot of like gratitude for everything that's happened you know that has brought me here wild and free that's how I see you now so to me it's very interesting to just regress and imagine you in a different way oh I was mean <laughs> I was mean. I was mean. But I, I feel you. But yeah, no more. No more. No that more. all went away. So that's behind me now. But I wish we had more time. But we may do a part two yeah. at some point. Maybe get more questions from, from everybody and see if anybody has any questions. But anyways, I'm here. If anybody wants to reach out sep you know, separately from here. Um, Thank you so uh, much. I love you too, Michelle. Aww. She's so sweet. Thank you so much to all the people that connected through through Instagram and all the people that are going to watch this. Yeah. Thank you, Rosie, for Thank sharing. You. Thank you. Thank you. What's your mom's name? You didn't share it. <laughs> Digna. Digna. Digna Maria. Like, Digna. Listen to this name. Like, Digna. Yeah. Digna. Um, I also want to thank um, not only you, Sylvia, I want to thank again Nick, um, which is Sylvia's husband, for providing the space for us, MCR. Uh, Miami Community Radio, which I've, you know, I, I put it on there as well um, in my story. And please follow them and cool. chime in because they have wonderful resident DJs that come here all the time. And they they really like rock this place. Really good community they have here as well. So thank you for that. I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Bye, guys. Thank you. Bless. Thank you for the inspiration from above. And it flew everything beautifully.